Good morning to everyone. If I haven't had a chance to greet you personally, I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles and you might be expecting me to say, turn to the book of Psalms, given the image behind me, <laughs> but I'm going to invite you to turn to your, the book of first Peter this morning, the book of first Peter. If you've been around Hope Community Church uh, for a good while now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, we've already preached all the way through the book of 1 Peter. We have, <laughs> but as I look around the room, quite a few of you, in fact, most of you were not here for that series, and I was thinking about this passage and this message in particular as I've been thinking about this little short series that we've been in, talking about the hope of the gospel, not just for eternal life, but for this life, and particularly in this life as we walk through the ine inevitable storms and, and struggles that uh, are promised to us and that are um, unavoidable. So I, I just thought this, this, this passage here would be a good way to sort of take a ribbon and tie a bow on this series here as we uh, look ahead uh, in the coming weeks to returning to Hosea. But for now, I want to just bring one final message this morning from the book of 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to look at three verses in chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. I'll read those three verses for us just to begin here. 1 Peter 5, 5 says this, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Well, in 1988, many people around by that far, man? 1988, a gentleman by the name of Bobby McFerrin, he made history, music history. He wrote and performed the first a cappella song ever to hit number one on the U.S. pop charts. This same song would go on to be named Song of the Year in 1988. Now, the name Bobby McFerrin may not ring a bell to you, and maybe you weren't even around or remember 1988, but I wonder if some of these lyrics might ring a bell. Mr. McFerrin sang these words. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. <laughs> Be happy. In every life, we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry. Be happy. Hey, ain't got no place to lay your head? Somebody came and took your bed? Don't worry. Be happy. The landlord say your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry. Just be happy. The name of the song, of course, is... Don't worry, be happy. Before we go any further, let me just go ahead and now apologize to you all, especially those of you who tonight will be trying to go to sleep and you'll have this song rolling around in your head. I, I do apologize for that in advance. But we know it, don't we? And it's a catchy tune and clever lyrics and good rhyming and an obviously very commercially successful song. But my hope is as we work our way through this passage in 1 Peter... We've been given some really, really bad advice uh, in this song. We're at the end of uh, the epistle of 1 Peter. And let me just remind us by way of context why the book of 1 Peter is in your Bible. The early church, the first century church, were, as this letter was being written and read to them, were under persecution, state-sanctioned persecution at the hands of Emperor Nero. This is not about... Preparing for the storm, they are in the storm. And Peter's writing to them. And as we write, reach the end of the letter here, 
he's giving some final exhortations to the church as he's about to sign off. And with all due respect to Mr. McFerrin, the Apostle Peter has a slightly different or radically different message. And he's telling the church in the first century, and I believe he would tell us today that in the midst of our troubles and our trials and our sufferings, the attitude that we should possess or that we should aspire to, our overarching pursuit should be that not of happiness, but humility. I want to speak this morning on this subject. Don't worry, be humble. Don't worry, be humble. And we're going to see Peter admonishing three things here for us to be humble towards leadership, humble towards one another, and ultimately humble towards God. So look at the beginning of verse 5 and, and, and consider being humble towards leadership. Verse 5, the beginning says, Likewise, you who are younger be subject to the elders. Paul here is calling for submission to or subjection to the elders. This, this word being subject to is a military term. It, it speaks of lining up under one's authority and being willing to submit to the orders that they give. That's what Peter's calling someone to. But we have to ask the question, who is he speaking to? He says, you who are younger. Now, some have speculated that this is merely... Just a general exhortation to the younger folks in the church to submit to, listen to the older people in the church. I want to just say, go on record for saying, I don't think that's bad advice. It does indeed contain a great deal of wisdom into it. Younger folks, children, youth. Some shocking news for you. Your parents are smarter than you. Your parents are wiser than you. Your parents know more than you know. I know that is absolutely shocking because they can't quite figure out WhatsApp and Instagram and TikTok and all of these, but they really do know more than you know. So if this is what Peter was saying, I would, I would be going, amen, Peter. The younger people should be subject to those who are older in the church. But I don't believe Peter is limiting the scope of this command here. The context, remember context is king. The context of this passage is going to show that he's not just talking about older people in the church, but he's actually talking about those who hold the office of elder uh, in the church. Therefore... This command then becomes for the whole church to subject themselves to the elders. Why would I say that? Look at how verse 5 begins. You see that word there? Likewise. That's what we call a connecting word. It's, he's linking what he's saying to what he has just said. If we were to take the time to read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 5, we would see that Peter has just given instructions to the elders and how they should be acting in the church and during this time. And we need to pause and say, well, who are these elders that are talking? Are they just older people in the church? No, this, he's speaking about the leadership in the church. Another word for elder is pastor or overseer. And Peter has just addressed them, and now his concern shifts towards the church responsibilities to and attitudes towards its elders. You've heard me say this before. There, there are essentially three realms of authority that have been established by God to sort of, as he providentially uh, works out his plan for humanity. He's established the government, and he's established the family, and he's established the church. And within each of those realms, God has not only established those institutions, but he's established a level of authority in all of them. An authoritative structure in all of those. And we need to know that Peter already in this letter has reminded us as Christians that we are to be subject to and submit to the, this authority. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, speaking of the government. He says, be subject to, for the Lord's sake. Same word that he's using here. Be subject to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme 
footnote, same emperor that's persecuting them, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Paul is calling for submission to governing authorities. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he moves inside the home and he says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Again, he's calling the church to submit to the authoritative structure that he has set out in the families and in the homes. And now here, Peter is calling us to the same submission to the authority that he has established in the church. And Peter's not just going out on a limb here. He's not standing alone. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 13, 17, that we are to obey our leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So I believe Peter speaking to the entire church as to its attitudes to its leaders. Well, you may ask the question then, why, why would he say you who are younger? Why would he point out seemingly a specific group in the church? And perhaps Peter is, is doing this because he knows that uh, it's the younger people in the church who are most likely to stand up and rebel against authority. And if you don't understand that, you've either never been a teenager or you don't have teenagers yet. Young or old, what does submission require? It requires humility. How do we, how do we conjure up? How do we... Uh, what's our motivation for this humility towards the elders in the church? We need to recall the nature of biblical elders. Let me underscore biblical elders. We, we need to remember that biblical elders are not just people who are self-appointed and decided one day they woke up and go, you know what? I'm an elder. I'm a pastor. Come. <laughs> no, if you'll recall from our study of 1 Timothy, which we worked our way diligently through not all that long ago, who are the elders of the church? What are their qualifications? These are men who've been called by God, first and foremost, by virtue of a God-given desire that he places into them. If any of you aspires to the office of elder, and then this inner calling... That, that men get from God, this calling is evaluated. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's affirmed by other mature, godly people. With regard to the biblical qualifications of eldership, we find there in 1 Timothy and in Titus. And these are men who have demonstrated a level of spiritual maturity and godly character that is worthy to be emulated. That's a biblical elder. That's the office, and that's the position, and that's the person that Peter is calling the church to subject themselves to here. And, and that should be our response, is that we willingly and graciously and humbly submit ourselves to the leadership of the elders. But Peter's going to continue. This is a virtue, humility, that's not only to be directed towards the elders, but to all within the church. Look at the last half of verse 5 and see how we're to be humble towards one another. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There might be a little bit of debate, a little bit of confusion, a little bit of uncertainty about who Paul is addressing by addressing the younger in the church in that command. But he leaves no doubt who he's speaking to here. Look, you see what he says? All of you. He's speaking to everyone in the church to humble themselves towards who? Each other. That, that's how we're to consider each other. We're to humble ourselves to one another. Well, it would help to know what humility was. If I'm to display that to you, what is, what is humility? The word humility speaks of a lowliness of mind. It's this idea of having a, a deep sense of I'm little in comparison to others. I'm little, they're big. Paul in Philippians chapter 2 really does a good job of, of defining and applying this to us. In Philippians 2, 3, he says, 
speaking to the church, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Paul defines that word humility in the context of giving the command to be humble towards one another. Peter here pictures humility as a garment that we wear. He's saying it should be so obvious to us, just like the clothes on your back. He says to clothe yourselves with humility. And the first century church would have known exactly what Peter was getting at here. Because see, the first century slaves, how were the slaves identified? They would identify a white scarf or apron to their outer garment. And that, that white, white scarf or apron marked them as a slave and distinguished them from free men. It was obvious. And anyone laid eyes on that person, they knew whether that person was a slave or free. We actually, in your Bibles, you have a portrait of this whether you recognize it or not, or haven't considered this before. It's actually in the Gospel of John, when Jesus watched his disciples' feet. In John chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. It wasn't Jesus just being pragmatic. That wasn't Jesus going, well, I'm going to need a towel anyway. I might as well go ahead and grab one. No, this towel that our Lord Jesus Christ tied around his waist said this, I am your servant. He clothed himself with humil in humility first, and then he proceeded to wash the disciples' feet, the most humble of a servant's task in that day. What's Peter's point? That our, so too, our humility should be on display. Have you heard this expression? As plain as the clothes on your back. How do, we, how do we find that motivation for humility again? Peter actually helps us with that and gives us that motivation by quoting Proverbs 3.34. Why should we humble ourselves towards one another? Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It is a channel for God's grace in our lives when we humble ourselves and consider others before ourselves. It's one of those seeming paradoxes of the Christian life. The way up is down. When we humble ourselves, God raises us up. And here's a challenge for us, for each of you. Find a, find a place, take your New Testament this week during your quiet times and see if you can ever find a place in your New Testament where God ever, where Jesus ever gives grace to a proud, arrogant, self-righteous sinner. I'm going to go on record and I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you're not going to find it. Rather, God's grace is reserved for those who humbly submit themselves to him. Again, we can turn directly to the Gospels and we can find a, another portrait of this clearly on display when Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax collector who went into the temple to pray. Do you remember that parable? The Pharisee stood by himself in Luke 18, 11 and said this, God, thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. It's almost as though he pointed and said, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. And Jesus' attention turns to the tax collector and says, but the tax collector, standing far off, could not even bring himself to approach God closely. Wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, a sign of remorse and sorrow and mourning. Just cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And listen to Jesus' punctuation mark on this parable here. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I don't have to tell you. You know, it has been 
an incredibly challenging 18 months up to now. COVID, coronavirus, pandemic, these are all words that we probably would have never really used, but they've become a part of our everyday life. Now, on the one hand, I just want to to put this out there and just say to Hope Community Church how grateful I am and how extraordinarily blessed Pastor O'Neill and I feel that issues related to this issue have not divided us, have not caused division, have not upset uh, the unity that we have here. But I want to just say that that has not been the case here in Ireland, in America. I spent all summer talking to pastors and just how disrupted the church has become. Even in some cases, church is being split because of disagreements. And I don't Doubt for a second there are disagreements in this room here on some of these issues. But how these disagreements and and, and differences of opinion and and differences in preferences have led to terrible things happening in churches really everywhere. But the reality is we can look past COVID, we can look past this pandemic And we can see that historically, the style of music that's played, the color of the carpeting that's chosen for the new worship center, or the type of tea that's, is it full fat or is it half fat milk? Or, uh, you know, do we have drums in the music? Or what translation are we going to use in the church? And all of these things have led to so much division. And And I just can't help but ask, in light of the passage before us today, how much of this could be avoided? How much of this would be avoided if rather than you and I insisting on our own way, insisting that things be done in line with my preferences, if the church of Jesus Christ humbly submitted to her God-ordained leaders and truly under God considered others more valuable than themselves, how much of this could be avoided? What testimony would we have to give if, if that was our default uh, position? That's not a call to just accept things blindly and never ask questions. But once decisions have been made, just, just falling in line and, and just working through and, 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 and seeking to honor God through obeying his commands here. Because this is exactly what Peter's calling us to here. We're to be humble towards our leaders and elders. We're to be humble towards one another. And finally, in verses 6 and 7, Peter exhorts us, we're to ultimately be humble towards God. Look at verse 6. Humble your, yourselves, <laughs> therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your cares upon him or on him because he cares for you. I said earlier that humility is really like the conduit or a channel of God's grace into our lives. We want more of God's grace, be more humble. It's just how it works. You would think knowing that, that humility would be our default position, then wouldn't it? If we truly embrace that, if we truly believe that, I mean, who of us doesn't want to enjoy more of God's grace? But we know better. (laughs) And Peter knows better. And therefore, he gives this final imperative to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Mighty hand here speaks of God's strength and his power. And when we truly consider God's strength and power, again, humility reminds us that that means we are weak and powerless. It speaks of our inability versus God's ability. He's telling us, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Why? So that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Again, notice the contrast. When we humble ourselves, God exalts us. He lifts us up. And it's a struggle for us in the 21st century. 
It's a struggle for us in this day and age in which we live, this look at me culture. Can you say social media? What is social media? Look at me. Look at what I did. Look at what we, where we've been. Look at what I had for breakfast. Look at what I had for lunch. <laughs> look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Like me. Subscribe to me. Share me. Promote me. Exalt me. Friends, we need to learn to take God's at his word. Remember, he's preaching to people under severe adversity here, and he's telling them, and Peter's reminding them that God will lift us up out of our adversity. God will deliver us from our trial. God will promote us. God will exalt us. But here's the hard part. Do you see it there in verse 6? At the proper time. At the proper time. What does that mean? What is the proper time? Because <laughs> when we're in a storm, it seems proper. Come on, Lord. Proper time. I I'm done. Any time now. But it means God's appointed time. You see, true humility before God means not only trusting God that he will act, that he will do it, but it's trusting that he will act at exactly the right time, the time that he has determined, get this, in order to fulfill the purpose for which you're going through that trial to begin with. Again, biblical portraits of this. Consider Joseph became one of the most powerful men in the world, in the Egyptian empire, but he didn't begin that way. For years, he suffered as a prisoner and as a slave before he was exalted into this position in Egypt. We studied the life of Solomon this morning in Sunday school, and we remember his father, King David, who was anointed king years before he ever took the throne of Israel. And, and during this time, he was on the run from King Saul, fearing for his life before he was ever exalted to that rightful place as the king. Consider Jesus. For years, the Jews, hundreds of years, had been praying for deliverance, had been praying for a Messiah, been praying for someone to come and liberate them, right? What does Galatians 4.4 4 tell us? But when the fullness of time had come, same idea Peter's getting at here, just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. What do these examples remind us? What are we to learn from them? Humility in the midst of our trials takes not only trust, but trust and patience. Trust and patience. Maybe you've prayed like I'm tempted to pray sometimes. God, I just need to be patient. Will you give me patience? And if you don't mind, Lord, would you hurry up and answer that? prayer. What, is, what does it look like? How, how do we know if we're patiently and humbly trusting the Lord? Is there any way that we, is there any indication to know whether or not that actually is marking out my life or not? Well, we, we find our answer in verse 7, this next phrase here. Look at what Peter says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He's talking about our anxieties here. What is anxiety? It's a word that, that, that means in the original language to be feel drawn in different directions. Like someone has this arm and someone has this arm and just pulling you apart. And, and life is coming down on you and there's a circumstance that you don't know which way to go. And you just, your heart is just almost, can anybody relate to that? It's okay. We're, we're a Baptist church, but it's okay to raise your hand. Not a, we're a Baptist church. It's okay. And don't, we don't normally ask for that, but if, if you saw just around the room, there were a few brave people that actually raised their hand. That was not to embarrass those people or to make you feel in any way uncomfortable. But it's to remind us we're not alone. It's not to cast judgment, but to show how important it is to be here and to, and to encourage one another. 
It's what this series has been about. Just a recognition that in every Christian's life, it's not always smooth sailing. We can be rocked at times by the storms of life. And, and, and Peter's not denying that here. You've got to remember who he's writing to and why he's writing. Peter's not denying these things. He's rather affirming the existence of these anxieties, these cares, these concerns. I mean, he's, he's calling us to be casting something. I mean, if there was nothing, I can't cast it, right? <laughs> All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, Paul told Timothy. Jesus said it this way, in this world, you will have tribulation. So it's not that having worries or anxieties or troubles is foreign or strange, that you're somehow less than as a Christian. Rather, the focus here, we're, we, we, need to, we need to grab out of this passage here is how do we handle and respond to them when they come? How do we handle them? Verse 7, casting all your anxieties on him. I love to fish. And I love, I, I love when I was a little, I, mean, I was fishing since as long as I can remember. But when you're really, really small, your fishing is kind of limited to a stick with a line on it. And that's as far as you can fish. But then when you get a little older and you get a little bit of dexterity, you know, I remember dad buying me my first fishing reel. And what that allowed me to do is I no longer was confined. I could take my fishing reel and my bait and I could cast it far away from me where the big fish really were. And that's what that word cast means. It's to throw away with force. It's not to hold on to. It, it, it's to get rid of them. And, and what are we casting here? These anxieties, these things that are tearing us apart, these things that are, have us unsure which way we're to go. But I don't want you to miss this in verse 7. Peter is not giving a separate command here. He's already given us the command in verse 6. Humble yourselves. That's the imperative. That's the command. So he's not saying humble yourselves and cast your anxieties on him. What's Peter saying? Humble yourselves by casting your anxieties on him or while casting your anxieties on him. What, what's happening here? Peter's making a connection between our anxieties and humility, which is what these verses are really driving at here. What, what's that connection? Let's dissect that a little bit. What's the opposite of humility? And it's okay to answer out loud. What's the opposite of humility? Pride. Pride. And what is the opposite of casting something? Keeping it to yourself. So if casting our anxieties on God is part and parcel to humility... Wouldn't hanging on to our anxieties be the equivalent of pride? Get a little quieter. What does it sound like? Here's what it sounds like. Why me? What have I done to deserve this, Lord? Where are you, Lord? I deserve better than this. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't see how I'm going to fix this. I won't ask for show of hands this time, but is that where we are sometimes when these moments come into our lives and we worry and we fret and we despair to the point that we are unable to think or rationally cope with things and unable at times even to deal with other matters in our lives and, and take care of other responsibilities because in our mind, our time and our attentions are, are completely self-absorbed in these moments. And if, and, and if doing so, if it's true what Peter, if the connection I've made here between holding on to anxieties and pride, we have to call pride what it is. It's a sin against God. Because God has a better way for us to handle these moments. How do we handle them? Well, we could just ignore them 
and hope that they just go away and trust that maybe somehow time will heal all wounds. You know, don't worry. Be happy. Just pretend. Put on the happy face. Put on the mask. Or we could follow the world's message. You can fix. You can do anything you want to. It's all about you. The, the power to change lies within you in and of yourself. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. The very essence of anxious care. <laughs> he says the, the real issue with anxiety is this. Imagining that we are wiser than God and thrusting ourselves into his place to do for him what he's undertaken to do for us. Okay, God, I trusted you for a while, but you're obviously not involved, so just move and I'll fix this, and then I'll come back. No, no, no. That's completely opposite of what Peter's telling us to do here. We could do it. The third option is God's way. What is God's way? You've heard me say this before. I could summarize the Bible for you in two words. God says, trust me. Trust me. And when we boil it down, the, the choice before us this morning is, is simple. You and I can either trust in man, that includes ourselves, or we can heed Peter's command and humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Such humility and submission to him and his will is an exercise of faith. Believing that come what may, God will exalt us in due time. Maybe you're wondering. Maybe this question in the back of your mind is, how do you know? How can you be so sure? Well, Peter tells us how we can be sure at the end of verse 7. Here's the evidence. Here's all the proof you need that you humble yourselves, cast your anxieties on the, on the Lord at, at just the right time. God is going to exalt you. How do I know this? Because, Peter says, he cares for you. Do you forget that sometimes? This, this is where Mr. McFerrin's brilliant songwriting and biblical theology diverge. The, the, the problem with don't worry, be happy, isn't that happiness and the desire to be happy is bad. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we should, you know, we should just walk around and try to be the most miserable people on the planet. That, that's not what we're saying here this morning. The problem with this philosophy of don't worry, be happy is this. It never tells us why. It never reveals the source of our happiness. It doesn't ground happiness in anything objective or concrete. It basically says ignore everything, pretend your problems don't exist, and somehow, as if by magic, happiness is going to emerge out of it. it. May sell a lot of records. Terrible theology. Memorable, but not at all helpful. Our New Testament, on the other hand, brothers and sisters, is replete with descriptions and attitudes and pursuits of the Christian life such that we can know and attain true blessedness or happiness. And, and Peter sort of sums all of those up here for us in one simple statement that if we could just wrap our arms around, our minds around this morning, I believe it would change us. God cares for you. God cares for you. Now, I know we live in a, in a day and, and, and there's churches all around and, and that's all. The, you just got to preach the love of God and the love of God and God loves you and you're so special and you're awesome and you're great and God loves you and they never speak of sin. They never speak of righteousness. They never speak of holiness. They never speak of the wrath of God and it's love, 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 love. And we need to be very careful with that, that we have about, but at the same time, we need to be so careful that we never remember what Peter has just reminded us of here. God cares for you. God loves you. If you're God's child, he absolutely loves you. You say, how do I know that? The gospel, remember? The gospel is our hope, not only for eternity, but in this life as well. How do I know God loves me? 
What does the gospel tell me? That in eternity past, God set his affection on us and called us his own by his grace. Why? Because he loves you. The gospel tells me that through the preaching of the gospel, God called you into relationship with himself. Why would he do that? Because he cares for you. And when you became his child, God took all of your sins and he wiped them away and you're completely 100% forgiven. You cannot ever not be forgiven by God. Why? God cares for you. God's redeemed you. He's adopted you as his child. You are prince, says, and princesses of the most high king. Why? God cares for you. We talked about this last week. Right now, in this moment, child of God, Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And what's he doing? He's praying for you. Why? He loves you. And right now in your life, whatever's going on, or your seas calm, or your seas rocky, or do you see the storm coming, or are you just kind of recovering from the storm you just went through? Right now, God is working all things in your life out for our good and your good and God's glory. Why? He cares for you. He loves you. Facts don't have feelings. Not about do you feel loved. You are loved by God. Paul would continue in Romans 8.35, having made his case for God's affection on his children. And he, he would ask the question this way, somewhat rhetorically, but he takes the time to answer the rhetorical question then. In light of all of this, who shall separate us from the love of God? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. These things, are they going to separate you from this love of God? Verse 37, no. <laughs> In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then listen to this punctuation mark. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels or rulers, anything present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, just in case I forgot something specific, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You will never be outside of God's love. So what say you this morning, Hope Community Church? What will you cling to when these storms come along, when these anxiety-causing trials come your way? What's your hope? Don't worry, be happy. Mm. Peter gives us something here better. Humility. Being humble towards the leaders that God has placed in authority in your life. Trusting in their wisdom, trusting their counsel, trusting their leadership. Being humble towards the family, the spiritual family that God has placed you in. As we come together to practice the one another's on each other. And ultimately, being humble towards God. Trusting in him. Trusting in his love for you. Trusting in his promise that he will never leave nor forsake you. Trusting that he's a sympathetic high priest. He experienced every facet of human emotion, experience, and temptation, yet remained without sin. And then he gives that to you. You're casting your worries and anxieties on him. Because when we do, what does this do? It frees us. It frees us to deny ourselves, to love God, and to serve others. What's Peter's message to us this morning? 
in a phrase, don't worry, be humble. Let's pray.